Hey there everyone, it's Mr. Lane here, and in this lecture we will look at art from the Rococo to Neoclassical period, the 18th century in Europe and America. Take good notes and let's begin. Here are the three artworks we will be analyzing. Here's a list of some key terms. Our key ideas. The time period is from 1700 to 1750. There was a shift of power to the aristocrats paralleled in Baroque and Rococo. The French Royal Academy set the taste for art in Paris. We're going to see strong satirical paintings. The epitome, paintings that show aristocratic people enjoying leisures. Rococo art can typically be seen as playful and lighthearted. People who were spending money were the aristocracy who were looking for paintings to decorate their homes. Rococo comes from the French word rocale, which means shells. So Rococo is a combination of the two French words, thus meaning stone shells. There's also preference for curved lines. And lastly, the content is not going to be seen as religious or historical, but be more concerned with love, eroticism, and playful type of subject matter. Before we move forward, let's look at a few examples of Rococo art so that you can get a sense of some of the characteristics. Starting with the colors. Pastel colors were commonly used. The predominant color you see here is pink, which actually during this time of the 18th century was seen as a masculine color as a version of lighter red. In regards to subject matter, we're going to see people from the aristocratic class with lots of money. There won't be any connection to religion, and these are not historical paintings, neither. Rococo art also has a preference for curved lines. Not going to see many strong diagonals. Fragonard was a first-rate colorist whose decorative skill almost surpassed his masters. An example of his manner can stand as characteristic not only of his work but also of the later Rococo in general. Fragonard's swing exemplifies Rococo style. Pastel colors and soft light complement a scene in which a young lady flirtatiously kicks off her shoe at a statue of Cupid with her lover gazing at her. In the swing, a young man has convinced an unsuspecting old bishop to swing the young man's pretty sweetheart higher and higher, while her lover and the work's patron in the lower left corner stretches out to admire her from a strategic position on the ground. Here's just a close-up scene of the lady's lover hidden in the bushes, who's also the work's patron. On the left, you can see the angel using the gesture, shh, don't tell. The older man is not aware of what's happening on the other side of the swing. You can also see the two cupids being playful with each other. The location of the swing, some garden or villa that's overgrown and out of control. The 
Now let's look at some characteristics of neoclassical art. This painting is titled Cornelia, presenting her children as her treasures or mother of the Gracchi. This takes place after a visitor has shown off her fine jewelry and then haughtily insists that Cornelia show hers. Instead of taking out her own precious adornments, Cornelia brings her sons forward, presenting them as her jewels. This is an example of virtue, which is drawn from Greek and Roman history and literature. Another theme in neoclassical art is sacrifice and courage. Here we see some classical and mythological themes with contemporary settings and costumes. Other themes include patriotism, honor, and human rights. Benjamin West's major innovation was to blend contemporary subject matter and costumes with the grand tradition of history painting. Here, the painter likened General Wolfe's death to that of a martyred saint. This period was the start of the Enlightenment, which took place between 1750 and 1815. The Enlightenment brought about the rejection of royal and aristocratic authority. They believed that rational thought should supersede tradition and religion, and were asking questions about the validity of church. It was supported by Napoleon in order to be associated with the successes of the ancient Roman Empire. Jacques-Louis David becomes the first painter of Napoleon. Neoclassical art was more democratic, with themes of courage, patriotism, and civil duty. Current events were depicted that had classical influences. And lastly, the late 18th century was also the Industrial Revolution. Cast iron and carvings from bronze is cheaper than carving marble. One example would be the Colebrookdale Bridge. Here we have Jack Louis David, Oath of the Harati. The Enlightenment idea of a participatory and knowledgeable citizenry lay behind the revolt against the French monarchy in 1789. But the immediate causes of the French Revolution were France's economic crisis and the clash between social classes. The artist who became the painter ideologist of the French Revolution was David. And as you can see here, the soldiers he modeled were actually off of the ideal Greek warrior, referencing the classical period. The scene depicted here is from an ancient Roman history. The Roman state is at war with the nearby city of Alba. Instead of going to war, they send three brothers to battle it out, and whoever survives is the side that is victorious. Rome sent three Herati brothers, and Alba sent three Karate brothers. Things get complicated because there are intermarriages between the families. No matter who wins, they both lose. One of these ladies is a Karate sister who is married to one of the Harati brothers. The other is a Harati by birth and will marry one of the Karate. We see the father holding swords as his sons take an oath to battle to the death.
The anatomy is inspired by ancient Greek and Roman art. If we were analyzing the linear perspective, this would be the vanishing point. Artist on art. David on Greek style and public art. Jacques-Louis David was a leading neoclassical painter in France at the end of the 18th century. He championed a return to Greek style in the painting of inspiring heroic and patriotic subjects. In 1796, he made the following statement to his pupils. I want to work in a pure Greek style. I feed my eyes on antique statues. I even have the intention of imitating some of them. The Greeks had no scruples about copying a composition, a gesture, a type that had already been accepted and used. They put all their attention and all their art on perfecting an idea that had been already conceived. They thought, and they were right, that in the arts, the way in which an idea is rendered and the manner in which it is, it is expressed is much more important than the idea itself. To give a body in a perfect form to one's thought, this and only this is to be an artist. We see strong differences between Rococo and Neoclassical. We have virtue as opposed to the indulgence. Our last painting, The Death of Marat. David depicted the revolutionary Marat as a tragic martyr, stabbed to death in his bath. Although the painting displays severe neoclassical characteristics, its convincing realism conveys pain and outrage. When the revolution broke out in 1789, David accepted the role of de facto minister of propaganda, organizing political pageants and ceremonies requiring floats, costumes, and sculptural props. David believed that art could play an important role in educating the public and that dramatic paintings emphasizing patriotism and civic virtue would prove efficient as rallying calls. However, rather than continuing to create artworks focused on scenes from antiquity, David began to portray scenes from the French Revolution itself. Here's a video link where you can learn more behind the story of the death of Marat. Thanks for watching everyone. Here are some additional resources for you.